Thank you so much to everybody who stayed with us for the final session um, of the conference. I know it's, it's quite late for some people, but we really do appreciate, we really appreciate the, um, the time that people have, um, have, have devoted to, um, to presenting today. I'd like to thank all our presenters. Um, I, the sessions I've been in have been really so top notch. They've been so good. I've been really, really, really pleased. And that, and that goes, uh, uh, that's a credit to our, our conference program committee. You know, we spent um, a long time looking very carefully at submissions to the conference. And I think it really does make a difference to have um, a conference program committee, which brings people from a, a range of different backgrounds, from a range of different countries to look at research and practice from around the world. Um, thank you too to our chairs, you know, um, I much appreciate uh, your time and you know very smooth chairing which i've seen and i'm aware of you know kind of through this session um but sometimes it's a thankless job to tell people to hurry up or make sure the time um, um is, is, is sufficient but it's a really important job and i've seen some sort of great interactions and questions between um everybody i like to kind of thank um the ocd team you know for their work i really appreciate that it's a small team and we've worked uh, i think above and beyond really hard to make this event work i'm really pleased um, and finally, I'd like to thank um, Jacob Morgan, our sponsor. You know, their sponsorship is really important. The whole of the Career Readiness Project couldn't have happened without that support. And, you know, we're really grateful for it. And um, I think it's been uh, a, a, a very worthwhile investment. Um, so I hope everybody here has had a, uh, uh, a, um, a, a satisfactory and effective um, use of their time. We're going to put up a little poll, actually, just to ask people, because um, we're asking ourselves whether we should um, or whether we will so that do another conference like this in a year's time. We hope to and we, we, we plan to, but it'd be useful just to get your reaction. So Hannah, if you wouldn't mind putting up a little poll and then we'll finish with the, the last discussion, the conversation, which will end um, the conference. Yeah, let's try to run the poll now. Okay. Just tell me if you can see this. Is everybody able to see the poll? Um, uh, it. Yes. Looks good to me. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. So just what's your instinct at this point? And then, um, you know, in our follow-up, we, we'd like to have people, you know, give us their um, uh, feedback, if there are things which you think we could do differently, um, if we do this again. Um, but we'd like to have, you know, your, your reactions, you know. Um, be very honest, be very honest. Excellent, thank you. I think at that point we'll um, we'll um, um, end the poll. Okay. Oh, yeah. so we've got a second question, of course, haven't we? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That as well. And that's excellent. That's really helpful to us to understand, you know, the different backgrounds people are from. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. So, so I can close the poll. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. And do you want me to share the results? Uh, uh, they may be displayed already. I think people have seen them already. Okay, that's great. Excellent, thank you. And thank and you for just giving that, that snap, that, that snap appreciation. Um, okay, in this final session, this final session, um, I'm joined by uh, David Bluestone um, from Boston College in the United States. Uh, I'm sure many, many of you are aware of, of David's work. He's, he's many, many articles. Um, not least his, his book on, on work in the age of anxiety, um, which came out, I think, two years ago, which I, I think many people found, you know, enormously insightful and helpful. So David is joining us. Um, Deirdre Hughes is joining us. Deirdre um, is based in the UK, but has worked around the world. Um, and um, I was just sat in her um, uh, presentation um, about Derby and what she's done there. And it's really remarkable, a microcosm, you know, the work she's been able to do. And I think she's, um, she's at some of the cutting edge really in thinking about using technology within guidance, but um, um, it brings enormous experience of um, different systems from around the world, uh, both from her academic base and also very practical base as a, as a, as a guidance counsellor herself. And then thirdly, I'm joined by Jana um, Ketchinen from the, uh, the University um, of um, Ulvascula um, in Finland. And, and Jana um, 
uh, brings with a, um, a, a, a real insight into the use particularly of ICT um, in guidance. And I think Finland is one of the countries which we've been really interested in and has some, some excellent practice. And Jana is very much involved in a, a particularly European and international basis in working with countries and to understand what makes for effective sort of guidance. So uh, the four of us are going to um, uh, have a, uh, a bit of a sort of like a, a sort of download from the conference, highlighting some of the uh, some of the papers or some of the issues which we've heard, you know, which we feel have been particularly um, sort of pertinent, useful, insightful, thought provoking, and then also look uh, look forward and thinking about where we go next. You know, where is um, you know, we, uh, we had this conference at this time because we knew we had something ourselves at the OECD, something, um, you know, sort of new and, and, and we think important to say, you know, based upon this analysis, of these longitudinal data sets hadn't been done before. You know, we had the privilege of being able to do it. We wanted to do it quickly. So we worked really hard to get those, those, um, those results out. But at the same time, use that to sort of try and bring together a community and help amplify some of the really interesting work, the practice, the research which has been undertaken around the world. And so in this final session, I just really want to sort of like highlight and pick up some of the issues which uh, we've been looking at. And um, perhaps um, Deirdre I might turn to you first. Is there, um, you know, what are the takeaways for you? Or what are, what are one or two of the things which you've really noticed or you've, you've taken away from this conference? I'm so relieved that you didn't say to me which paper stood out in particular. Because <laughs> I have to say that um, all of the papers and all of the contributions um, in my opinion, we're, we're really first class. Um, I think the themes uh, that were chosen for the conference were just spot on. Um, I think some of the things that um, jumped out for me was that, isn't it so interesting that around the world, there are so many pockets of really, really good evidence-based practice. Um, you know, I just came out of a session listening to colleagues in New Brunswick and I want to go to New Brunswick. Um, there's so many really interesting things there. But earlier today, um, when we sort of think about um, our knowledge of career guidance and how it's unfolding, what this conference has shown us is that Eastern perspectives and Western perspectives are complementary and that we've actually got a, if you like, um, predominant Western perspective on some of these issues, but yet today, Certainly when we look at the work in uh, South Korea, uh, we listen today to Dr. Uh, Lee around Beijing and what's happening around uh, young people's Chinese aspirations. Actually, we need more forums like this to actually tease out the similarities and indeed the differences. For, for me, what really stood out was that um, Eastern Western perspectives that are still complementary, in some cases slightly different in terms of cultural context, but some of the same issues that we're grappling with, gender inequality, um, young people having very narrow views perhaps of occupations that are available to them and, and so much more. Yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, I, I think we might have been in the same session where we, we, we heard, um, I suppose, a, a worrying development, which is around students' anxiety. And uh, there was a very telling sort of statistic, which, uh, which was in one of the presentations um, from Dasha, uh, which looked at, um, which was interviewing actually university students, uh, big numbers, and asking them why they didn't um, interact, why they didn't connect with um, guidance, guidance um, resources. And 17%, 17%, 17% of the students said they hadn't, they hadn't connected because they were, and, you know, they were, they said that they agree that thinking about my career prospects makes me anxious. And I see that amongst young people I know, you know, um, you know, uh, teenagers. Uh, but it was, and it kind of reminds me of a, of a study of, um, of, of teenagers where um, a third of them said that they, they had career aspirations which they never told anybody about. And so uh, that student anxiety, you know, kind of seems to be, you know, a, a, a real concern in this age of COVID. And yeah. um, I, I mean, is, is that something which, um, you know, which you find um, particularly worrying? Very much so. Um, I think it's, it's young people and adults, but particularly young people. And I guess the exam question for each of us to consider is, um, where are the places and spaces that young people can go to for career support? And I, I think um, there's some interesting work 
I'm involved in, but it's working with adults, looking at well-being and mental health um, in a career guidance context with colleagues from Canada and the Career Development uh, Foundation. But we're already finding that when we interview the practitioners as part of that research, that they're saying that more and more young people are presenting where they're self-harming, where they are very, very anxious, um, or where they see that there's no hope for their futures because they've spent such a lot of time maybe in their bedrooms or you know, away from their peers. So I think it's something, Anthony uh, and colleagues, that um, we really, over the next 12 months, we need to actually get unpick that more. And maybe David, uh, in terms of his work, uh, has a view on it. But uh, I certainly think from a UK context, um, we've got to really, really be more attentive to this generation of young people. And I think we heard also the voices of young people have come out through this conference, um, you know, through the researchers who have interviewed. But we need to actually um, elevate maybe the voices of young people more going forward. I couldn't agree more, Deidre. I think <clears throat> the uh, pandemic has invoked a kind of collective level of, of what I call precarity. It's, it's a sense that the world doesn't feel as stable. I mean, some might argue that it's never really been stable and we were all able to maintain the, the, the defense of denial, one of the best defense mechanisms around. <clears throat> but the reality is people are, are at risk. And I think the title of the conference really comes back here, this idea of these disrupted futures. We don't know what the end of the, of the if there will be an end to the pandemic <clears throat> and how that will affect um, the career development process, we still have to kind of sort that out. Um, you know, for me, I think one of the things, and I wrote that book two years ago about uncertainty, but <clears throat> I mean, what we've seen in the last 18 months going from massive unemployment to now labor shortages, we kept hearing discussions about labor shortages. Who would have predicted that six or eight months ago? Um, my university wants me to write a piece on the great resignation. And um, it's, we don't really know a lot about these things. So I think young people feel this anxiety that there's so much, so much in flux. <clears throat> but um, if it's okay, can I dovetail into one of my um, takeaways here? Yeah, sure, David. Just just before you do that, yeah. I, just, I think I think one thing about this this growing evidence of anxiety is that um, it really underpins the need for really you know kind of trained, skilled counselors. <clears throat> It's not just about information. It's not just about sort of mm -hmm. things with workplaces. That counselling dimension, I think, it sometimes is, is possible to you know to to overlook. But also, you know, the necessity of starting early, because the anxiety seems to peak at these understandably at these transition points as young people go you know into upper secondary, then from upper secondary onwards. Um, and I think it really is um, it's, it's salutary to us uh, uh, to to remind us about the necessity of that. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think. <clears throat> this session we heard from the Cajon Valley folks about these early interventions, very critical, what's going on in New Brunswick. There's some great, there's some great templates out there of ways that we could intervene early um, and to provide youth with a sense of self-knowledge that could help them both to learn about themselves in the world of work, <clears throat> but also to help them learn about how they can navigate the world. The, the reality is helping people to develop these skills of resilience, <clears throat> of being adaptive, <clears throat> and of being flexible, they're really, really essential skills, and they, they are going to become much more of an explicit part of the career development process of helping people to develop these psychological skills to manage the world. Well, yeah, and I'll bring you in in a moment, but David, you, you, you had something that you wanted to highlight out of uh, session. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> I do have a, a point that I kept coming back to when I heard these sessions and actually when I read the proposals as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Waste invaluable time. <laughs> the main point I, I come away with is <clears throat> the multifaceted nature of, of, of the interventions that we're hearing about. <clears throat> the systemic nature of these interventions. And I felt like the most innovative, first of all, I also agreed with Deirdre that all the papers I heard, all the ones that were selected for this conference were all uniformly outstanding. And I really learned a great deal. But the main point about this multifaceted nature of intervention, I think is really critical. 
<clears throat> and it builds on something um, that I, I read about over the summer. I had the opportunity this summer to read a great book called The Ministry of the Future. It's a science fiction book by Kim Stanley Robinson. It's not an esoteric book. Uh, Barack Obama put it on his top 20 list of uh, 2021 or 2020. It's called The Ministry of the Future. Basically like an eco science fiction book about how the world can deal with climate change. And it kind of just takes a, a very proximal view in the next 10, 20, 30 years, what the world can look like. I don't want to give away the whole plot, but the main gist of it was the world was able to change it. It was actually written by a very progressive writer who's usually been kind of cynical about it, but his view was it involved <coughs> thousands of different kinds of interventions across so many different sectors. <clears throat> and I think that's the takeaway here that there's a lot of different ways to intervene. There's a lot of different intervention points, but that I, I felt like some of the programs in particular, the one in New Brunswick, the universal design one, <clears throat> gave us a really good clue of doing something, doing work systemically, but also providing ways to do individually tailored uh, career development interventions. Another takeaway is the need for career counselors and school counselors to have holistic training. Um, one of the one of the few positive, this one of the actually significant positive things in the United States, especially in the counseling movement, is that we train both school counselors and master's level mental health counselors to be skilled in both mental health and in career guidance. Um, so I don't know if that's possible in other nations, and it doesn't always work so well here because people often will specialize and not attend to the other domain. But I think this is a, a, a big need as we move forward that the career issues are integrated, inextricably connected to people's mental health. Yeah, no, let, let, let me bring you in, um, particularly because um, one of the uh, interesting pieces that I, I've read is about the, the group to work um, a method, uh, which is pioneered in Finland a few years ago where um, young people in their in vocational school at the end were, were brought together as a group to reflect upon um, what they need to do to be able to succeed in work. And um, that, you know, one, one of the outcome indicates, one of the outcome tests was that psychological well-being. Uh, but I don't know if you, there's anything around um, sort of anxiety or, or students which, uh, which you want to pick in, or perhaps you know, want to highlight some of the things which you've seen and, and you've heard uh, over the last three days. No, oh, I, I can just sort of strongly agree what Beatry and, and David already were highlighting. It is an important and uh, it's an important issue for us to focus and pay more attention on it. But if I just uh, uh, um, also agree on what David was saying, it, it has been very interesting to see the variety of practice and, and research that already exist and what we've heard and all the papers that I've been listing have been just excellent. Uh, I'm looking forward to opportunity to hopefully have the recorded videos and, <laughs> and see those others that I missed. Um, maybe, of course, because one of my own area is, uh, is relates to the interest in on the role of ICT. It was already interesting to see how very new, innovative virtual opportunities were presented. And that, of course, it relates that um, by having a better understanding of the new opportunities technology has arise, we, we also expand the opportunities for all youth, um, also having a little bit more better access to some of the information and, um, and um, and do some visits that may not be uh, possible in, in physical settings. But of course, on the other hand, we have to take into account that uh, the technology doesn't cover every, everyone. It's not accessible for everyone, but, but uh, also think the highlight. And one, the other, other takeaway was also the, the importance of an impact of practical work experiences that came strongly through and the practices that were presented. So those were, besides what David already mentioned and Dietrich, some of the highlights for me. Well, but actually I, I had a question I was gonna ask you about that or ask you, you know, give the opportunity to, to comment because one, one, one of my takeaways was 
uh, from the session on, on work experience. We had two sessions, we had two present presentations from Finland, which were which were which are both excellent. And um, one was about you know virtual work experience, virtual internships, and we married that with one from the UK. So we we, we managed to bring you know sort of two you know, perspectives on on that. But when when I think about the work experience placements, I, I always remember you know some work by um, an academic at Birmingham City University, Trisha Lagale. Um, who looked at the way in which students, uh, well, work experience often serves to underpin uh, social reproduction, that, you know, working class kids get working class um, experiences, middle class kids get uh, more professional managerial experience, regardless of where the interests are, because I, typically, you know, most young people now have very high ambition, which is a good thing, and we should encourage, but they're not being able to use this as an opportunity to develop and deepen their knowledge and, and networks and, and, and expertise. And in the Finnish system, it's, it's, it's really interesting because as I understand it, um, you know, so there's, there's a central mechanisms for sourcing the work experience placements. And so the students themselves don't have to go out and, and find them by asking their relatives, you know, where they can find, um, you know, these placements. So that by social reproduction will happen. But then through, you know, students, are, they've got good counselling, they're supported, uh, they still have to apply, you know, they still have to go through a process mm -hmm. and they learn through that. But it, it struck me that, you know, that method of, uh, of sourcing the placements and counselling students to approach the placements is probably going to be quite effective in challenging some of these inequalities which we see in some systems. Yeah, I think I think so. And I mean, if we take a, one step back, I think what is important is that we have a career education uh, so that it is a comp compulsory element in our curriculum. And as also the learning aims are written in, in curriculum and there is this work experience periods then this gives a, gives a mandate also, and it, it encourages career professionals and schools and, and society uh, to, to contribute on that. And as you said, since it is time, it, since it's uh, uh, in timetabled career education sessions that uh, youngsters are presented different occupations, they are presented different different career opportunities, they, they learn these, they learn to use the labor market information. And then it comes to this work experience, what we call the introduction to work, work experiences. Then they do think what are the possible interesting areas. Uh, and then they discuss with their peers, with the study counselor in these lessons, and then they are provided um, online uh, or or at least the knowledge is in the, in the area, but we have this online platform where uh, companies and workplaces by themselves present the opportunities. They can already see what are the tasks, what can be done. And those signs, what they can see in the city, logos and stuff, they actually come alive. They say, oh, I didn't know that this, this uh, company is doing or providing such uh, interesting uh, opportunities for us to go in. And it is an equity issue because then study councils also follow. We know that some students are very good on finding those places by themselves, or they may get support for parents, as you said. But then also those who might not be so uh, don't have so strong support in their families. It will be they are supported by study counselors, by subject teachers at the school, and also with the peers. And the whole process, they have assignments, what they do, they come back to uh, with these assignments, what they have done, and then they reflect among peers. Mm. And what is what, and I think this is very also crucial is that it's not only the study counselors or adults, but peers share their experiences among each other. And those collaborative career exploration moments in, uh, in, in these career education sessions or online settings where they do their reports, they are truly valuable and also um, help, each, help, uh, help youngsters to, to learn and get most out of these introduction to working life periods. And, and, and that, that very much resonates with, with our longitudinal findings where career conversations with families, with peers, as well as with, um, with the subject teachers are really associated with better outcomes. It kind of underpins that investigative, um, critical sort of mindset. Um, did you let me, let me turn back to you and ask you about, well, we've, we've just completed, um, um, the OECD, we've just completed a big piece of work. We've just had 
three days who have looked at work which has been completed from around the world. Um, is, is there, do you have a sense of what perhaps our collective priorities should be for, um, you know, kind of further, you know, work, research, policy practice in this area? Yeah, well, I, I think um, what we've got is a very, very strong foundation to build upon. And there are many other international bodies, Anthony, you're to be commended for being part of the Investing in Career Guidance movement with Thank the you. published published works. Um, for me, I, I think we do need to do a lot more on multicultural perspectives and multicultural training. Um, when it comes to uh, career guidance. Um, I think that's one area I would like to um, see more dialogue, discussion and, and evidence on. I would say this uh, because those who heard me speak on day one said that we need more stats and stories and return on investment is something I think I'd like to see more of where we are confident as academics and as practitioners alike that we can tell the story of the added value and return on investment. And I think the OECD um, is doing a fantastic uh, job in bringing together that evidence base that we can all build upon. Um, I think you mentioned climate change. You know, we've got COP26 happening here in the UK uh, in a few weeks time. Um, everybody's talking about the green economy. Um, and, uh, you know, it links in with labour market intelligence that we now know that the pandemic has actually thrown out all that historical uh, way in which we used to forecast labour market trends. We've got to start again and maybe look at crowdsourcing, look at new ways that we can uh, gather uh, that new intelligence about um, the, the world of, of work. And I thought my... Yeah, final thing I would say, Anthony, and I would say this because I'm interested in cities. I think wouldn't it be fascinating if we knew more about how cities are functioning when it comes to bringing together that social inclusion and economic enterprise, economic development strands. Um, I just think it'd be fascinating if we had more studies around what's going on in cities and finding solutions that's not to exclude uh, rurality, which is, is so important, but I just think there's an opportunity there maybe that um, mm. we could as a community build on. That's certainly been a theme uh, about communities coming together and needing to come together to provide the support which is necessary. Mm. Um, David, I saw you nodding um, when, when, when Deirdre was talking about some of the points that she was raising. What's yeah. your perspective? Yeah, uh, in terms of research, I think, um, <clears throat> I think OECD and the the career community is well positioned now based on this great research that has been done, the longitudinal research, to test this model of um, exploration, experiencing, and thinking, to operationalize it and provide resources and collaborations with, with scholars around the world who can examine how does this really work? What are the systems that work? I think another issue is this one of inequalities and cultural issues and social justice issues. <clears throat> um, to what extent is this tripartite model uh, useful in trying to equalize the playing field? Um, and I, I also think that um, just touching on this issue of thinking that we may want to also infuse into that the idea of critical consciousness, which I've done a lot of writing about and a lot of other people have. It's not a panacea. It's not going to solve all of our social and cultural and, and, and um, inequality issues. <clears throat> but helping people to think not just about their careers, but about the systems that they inhabit, I think could be really, really useful. And it might be useful to kind of do some program development, design work on that and, and research. And then I think finally is looking at the macro level factors that we, we heard in this conference. <clears throat> these kind of, you know, broad-based interventions and bring in scholars who have skills in doing um, analyses of macro-level systemic interventions, which I think would be really, really exciting. So I think OECD is well-positioned to do, to, is to um, really engage in some leadership in this area. So I think this, this conference has really helped to kind of catapult the findings and also create a community. Mm. 
and to kind of crystallize that in your head? Uh, well, the, the, the work that's been done in critical consciousness is really very, very interesting. And, and it's a reminder to us that what we want young people to have is really a, 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 a realistic insight into right. what the market is like. Um, and it's not just all about having high ambitions, it's understanding that um, it, has, uh, it has pitfalls, it has, it has challenges, it has problems, um, and they can be very significant as well as opportunities. Well, just one more point. If we look at the rise, and I hope you don't mind me being somewhat political here, the rise of right-wing politicians, I'll speak about in the U.S., when they study the voters, especially the kind of the voters who go deep into these kind of right-wing conspiracy theories, a lot of them, not all of them, but it's a fair number who are disaffected about work, who don't feel hopeful about their work lives, and who don't have a sense of anyone out there who's going to help them navigate it. So I think this issue, is what we can do in our field, and I'm not trying to kind of politicize our field, but in trying to help people read the world in of itself could help to um, reduce some of the more extreme elements that we see um, on the right. Uh, Jana, can I bring you in? Um, what, what's your perspective um, on where we should go next? Um, just continuing what the, the colleagues previously said, maybe also I think uh, international association and especially OECD is in, a, in such a position that uh, that it by do by continuing doing the good research and, and launching a new initiatives on research area we can support and uh, especially those countries which where the career guidance is still not maybe in such a strong positions so I think uh, strengthening the evidence that then then in, in these countries that need some more support is, is offered through these resources. I think there is still um, EIG group has a strong uh, position on, on doing research and, and it would be building the evidence base for that. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I, th I think that, I mean, I think, think these, these are all really, really, really kind of helpful perspectives. And um, I think, uh, what I would say is that in terms of uh, the OECD's work, um, you know, we plan to um, continue the career readiness um, sort of project. Um, looking forward, I think we've, you know, we've, we've identified um, um, empirical evidence which will allow us to have some confidence about the sorts of interventions which we, we've got greatest confidence which really work. And then that gives us the opportunity to, to really drill down into practice in those areas and look at qualitative studies and look at, at smaller studies. Um, and, you know, to really sort of like bring those to life as very practical, so like innovations. And when, when we have the PISA data, so we can see from the PISA data that in some countries, um, you know, almost nobody, you know, a fewer than 10% of, of young people by the age of 15 have engaged with workplaces. Um, we have countries with very high proportions are showing, you know, great uncertainty, great, you know, um, great, you know great levels of concern. Um, we're also um, very interested about um, questions around inequality and uh, the capacity of guidance to be able to, um, um, to address and, and potentially challenge inequalities and in their, in their different forms um, across society. And there's a lot of interest amongst the across the governments which we we work with and, and who are our bosses around around green jobs. You know, there's a the ILO estimates there's gonna be 25 million new green jobs so like coming through. Um, um, uh, and uh, you know, young people need to know about them, they need to understand them, and we need to go back and look what works in terms of uh, amplifying opportunities um, um, and 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 putting pathways in place to enable young people to move easily towards areas where, where there is growth. And so that's, that, that's gonna be our agenda. And in addition, we're gonna be looking, particularly around the use of ICT. Um, we really wanna understand, we get some brilliant examples of use of ICT. Uh, we'll be looking at virtual reality um, in guidance. And we kind of, you know, we think there's a lot of interest in this. And um, there's an opportunity there's an opportunity to, for, for us to take advantage of our position as, as this global partnership around us to, you know, to, to identify and shine a light on some of the really interesting practice and see the way that that will itself align with uh, what is becoming an emerging consensus, a very clear consensus, I think, about what's really effective in terms of, in terms of guidance. And I think uh, you know, this is like the, just like the final, fi final point would be that uh, we hope to you know, repeat this conference next year. Um, we hope to make it an annual event. We'll see how long we're able to do that. Uh, but we're, uh, we're, we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to do this. And if so, 
uh, I hope that uh, people will be able to join us um, for that because you know this conference title was Disrupted Futures. Um, I imagine futures are probably going to still be disrupted in a year's time. And at any time when you know the labor market is really dynamic, you know, it's really changing a lot, it makes it more important than ever that young people have access to good guidance. They have those first-hand encounters because um, you know, they need to hear for themselves. You know, is it worth pursuing a career in hospitality now? Is it worth pursuing a career in tourism? You know, what are the ways that you can balance out the risks? You know, uh, and in a dynamic situation, it's hard to make those decisions. Not, not that hot information which you can get from people, which can be facilitated by expert guidance systems, is really important. And just to finish, in that joint piece of work which we did, you know, with UNESCO and the ILO and the European Commission and CEDAFOP and the European Training Foundation, the headline from it really was that um, you know, never before in human history has guidance been so important. You know, for young people, it's very clear. You know, with the pandemic, people are staying in education. They're even before the pandemic, staying in education, bigger numbers than ever before, making more and more decisions to make. But with a dynamic labour market, those decisions are more difficult. And with increasingly marketized, um, you know, tertiary education systems. And the guidance has the role. Guidance has to be the thing which gives the tools to people to be able to show the agency which our societies expect of them now. And so um, we are hugely grateful to everybody who's been involved, but particularly to Deirdre and David and, and Jana for this last session. As next steps, we will be processing the video um, and we'll be making that available. It's going to take us, it's going to take us a few weeks. Um, a few of us are taking a bit of holiday next week and then we'll come back. Um, through the conference, we've been encouraging people to sign up for our, uh, um, our, our mailing list. We send out emails every month, tell people about what we're doing. Um, if you haven't done, email me, Anthony Mann, anthony.man at oecd.org and we'll put you on the list but we'll make sure that everybody's aware um, of, the, of the videos when they become available. And next year, we plan to uh, do a short publication where we highlight some of the, some of the key insights from, from the different papers which we've had. So part of the, the point of this is really to amplify this work. And you know, today, that work is really only just beginning. We'll continue to do that. Um, so I wanna thank everybody. This is, um, this is the end of our conference. So if you've got a taxi waiting, if you've got a train to catch, you've got a plane to catch. Um, if you want to so like, have a quick coffee with a colleague, take the advantage, you know, take the time, because we hopefully will see you all again in about a year's time. But I'm sure I will see many people here over, over the next few months. Uh, please do feel free to contact us. Uh, we're really interested. We're really uh, I'm interested in being part of this community. And we thank you all for joining us over these last few days. Thank you very much.